This week's episode of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast is brought to you by listeners like you. Head on over to patreon.com slash run, eat, drink podcast and subscribe today. Fans, founders, and insiders like you help us keep the Run, Eat, Drink podcast going. And we thank you for your support. Hello, this is Marco Chesero and welcome to Run, Eat, Drink podcast. Welcome to the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We feature destination races from across the country. And after the race, we take you on a tour of the best local food and beverage to celebrate. So whether you are an elite runner or a back of the packer like us, you'll know the best places to accomplish, explore, and indulge on your next runcation. Hey, welcome to episode 175 of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. I'm your host, Amy. And I'm your co-host, Dana. Coming to us remotely from the one, the only, the home of the Daytona 500. Daytona Beach, Florida. Yeah. I I I am our intrepid field reporter this week. Yes. Have you found us some great food and beverage options? Actually, I have. Really? Uh, there, are, there are a couple of spots here that I'm very eager to try once we have finished the 75 hard challenge. Really? So we now have some additional reasons to come up this way. Not to mention the fact that we're pretty close to the Jacksonville area once you once you're this far north and on the east coast of Florida. So, you know, as we are either going to or coming from the Donna when we head to Ooh, the Donna there you go. Half marathon weekend, I think that we could probably have an excuse to take a detour and come through Daytona Beach on our way home or on our way up. Mm, that sounds good to me. I yeah, but support that. <laughs> I am I'm once again traveling for work, and I am literally a stone's throw from the Daytona International Speedway. Anybody that followed along on the Couch to 5K program uh, a few weeks ago, that, that we finished a few weeks ago, uh, came along with me while I was literally running in the parking lot of the Daytona International Speedway. You so, never got into the Speedway. Are you going to try? Um, I actually, uh, th- through uh, the class here that I- I'm attending, they are going to be arranging a tour. So no. I'm going to get the opportunity. I- I'm hopeful that I may be able to get one of my classmates to take a photo or some video of me Yay. jogging on the on the track. We'll see. Oh, that would be awesome. Uh, Depends on what they'll let us do. Speaking of that 5K, that... Uh, program, that Couch to 5K program, we Mm -hmm. are going to recap a run that was on the tail end of that. That was not the culminating run, but uh, the one a couple of weeks post-program tonight, the Freedom 5K, we're going to recap. It's... We have a couple of local races that we like to do uh, down in our area of Southwest Florida, and the Freedom 5K is one of those, and we're going to get to talk about this. And it's a great opportunity for those that might want to do a summer vacation in Southwest Florida to plan to come down and maybe celebrate our nation's independence day Mm -hmm. and start that celebration off with a a 5K bridge run. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And... uh, then I believe that we're going to go back north uh, to the Orlando area for our food, are we not? We are. We we had, I, what do you call it, an embarrassment of riches? Yes. And I think Danny agrees, if you hear her in the background, that we had an embarrassment of riches as far as plant-based eating options at Walt Disney World, the Walt Disney World mm-hmm. Resort. And that's not a sentence I ever thought I would hear you or anybody else utter. Right. So the fact that we're able to give our listeners who are into plant-based eating some options when they go vacationing Mm -hmm. at Disney World, I think is a fantastic service we're going to be providing to this week. It's awesome. And this place gave us so many options. We had to have 
a few things from the menu, including beverages. Yes. Um, again, we don't do this too often, but we've we've done it a couple of times here lately where we do the food and beverage in the same place. Mm-hmm. And Skipper Canteen offered us an opportunity to do that. And this is going to be a non-alcoholic offering. Yes. And I really do have to thank Greg in Orlando. That's his uh, Instagram handle. Greg in Orlando actually said, this is a place you got to check out if you're eating plant-based, if you can get in. Very popular. Right. But we were able to Which, get in. And we'll talk about the challenges of that as well. Yeah. So without further ado, shall we talk running? Yeah, let's talk running. But before we get into the race, um, let's uh, give everybody your training update. How is uh, how is post weekly therapist visits? Oh. Um, how is how's that treating you? Well, Let everybody know what's up. I should be doing honestly more strength training than I am. I should be, we, you know, we had like a little mishap with the Bosu ball where we had to get it exchanged. It's back now though. It's back now, so I should get back on the Bosu ball and do some balance exercises and some strengthening of my quads, hamstrings, overall strength in, in the hips. I, I need to get back to those exercises. I've been woefully under training those muscles and I'm still as a part of the 75 hard challenge. We have two workouts a day and I have been incorporating the drills that Jeff Galloway, America's coach and our coach has sent me for homework. He sent me some cadence drills. He sent me some acceleration gliders. He said, start with two each a piece in your either your Tuesday or your Thursday short run. So I've actually been incorporating those when I'm walking the parking garage at work, when I'm under shade of the parking garage. You're sharing, and you're sharing those those sessions occasionally on your live streams. I've seen you do that a couple of times. Usually it's when I'm on my way back to work and I'm out in the hot sun and it's hard for me to see some of the comments <laughs> on the phone. But yes, I have... Um, I've been doing those and then I have been uh, jumping on a live chat with people just to check in. And it's, it's nice to have the cover of the parking garage to combat the afternoon showers. So I don't have to be outside, get soaked and then go back to work. But I do have a poncho in my bag so I can deal with that if I need to. But I do, I'm lucky enough to have the parking garage. So I can get there and I can do a little bit of very light hill work, I would say. Very, very light hill work. And then using, s- using the uh, elevation of the mm-hmm. parking garage as your hill. Yeah, That's- it's five stories. So I, I walk up and down the parking garage and then the the part that's under cover that's a really long stretch I'll use for cadence drills and acceleration gliders to kind of get my form back to where it needs to be so acceleration gliders you have 30 seconds and you count either the left or the right foot and uh, you you start with 10 walking steps and then you get 10 shuffling steps and then you get 10 more where you start to elevate your pace, you get up to kind of race pace, and then you glide. You let that momentum carry you through the rest of the 30 seconds. And that's an acceleration glider, and it's supposed to help you with going in and out of your run, walk, run. And then the cadence drills are 30 seconds as well. And it's you're either counting your your left or your right, foot and it's how many steps you can get in that 30 seconds and you're hoping between well he's telling me between 40 and 50 so the the purpose of that acceleration glider is to work on the smoothness of your transition between Mm -hmm. your your intervals yes and the cadence drill is to get you actually quicker during your run your run interval yes 
Yeah. And I think I've, it's I've also, talked. oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I've talked about that a little bit when I was doing the couch to 5k with everybody, but you're, you're living it. You're doing that. Oh, yeah. That's something you're incorporating into your training right now, which is good. Yes. Yeah. So it's good. I think it also, what I was going to say was it, it helps my walking turnover as well. Oh yeah. When I'm that's in the walking point. intervals, because that's where I am so tempted to slow down. And, right. it, you know, I mean, I'm walking, especially in later stages of the race, if I've gone out too fast or if it's a hot and humid kind of race, it's, you know, you, the walking interval is like, oh gosh, it's a break, but you can't let your walk get so slow that it, the, it, it dramatically impacts your pace. So. And it's easy to do if you're, if you're really tired, if you, um, Perhaps maybe you didn't train enough for the distance you're going to be running mm. when you do, or you, or you go out too hard and then you build up too much fatigue yes. and you end up walking too slow to the point where you create a, a pace deficit where right. you can't catch up no matter what you do in your, in your run interval. And these are things to think about. Oh, it is. And that's the reason Jeff talks about the fact that from the beginning of the race, you do your walk intervals. Mm -hmm. And that's something a lot of people have a really hard time with. I think it's part of his successful strategy that he teaches all of us that he e-coaches or who read his book, uh, Galloway's book on training, that it it's better to walk up front and finish strong, run more at the end than at the beginning and conserve those resources. So yep. that's those drills are helping me do that by by improving my form and my cadence. So that's what I'm focused on right now. And then the the long runs are just starting to ramp up into the 5k range for me because Jeff and I have been back and forth talking about our uh, my goal of 5k's and 10k's and then ultimately his half marathon in December and then Donna's half marathon in uh, February of 2022, which many people registered for last week. And anybody who's listening to the podcast right now, marathon weekend, Walt Disney World marathon registration um, day is the day of the release of this show. So may the force be with you. I hope you got into all the races you want so that you can get into the mindset where you can do those drills follow those training plans from Jeff Galloway and get to that finish line uh, healthy, strong, and and celebratory rather than slowing down in your cadence like we've talked Absolutely. about. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So that is a little bit of my training update. And you have a race to discuss and future training to discuss. Yeah, I, I. it's very rare that I have a race to discuss that doesn't involve you. Because um, I was at work. You were at work, so I was once again the Runny Drink Podcast's intrepid field reporter. <laughs> and this race we're going to talk a little bit about is one that we've run, I, I want to say that we've been doing it for the last three years. That's true. If I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. It was postponed and to October last year. I was going to say, it seems a little soon to be doing it again but that's only because during 2020 exactly the the july 4th race didn't happen until almost the end of the year so yeah. uh it, it came back around really quick and this is the annual freedom 5k that we have in cape coral that kicks off our day of celebration of independence day in our hometown mm -hmm. and this race is Normally, you know, pretty well attended. I, I would probably say in, in previous years when we've run it, we get, you know, 400, 500 attendees, give or take. Yeah. It's usually very well attended by yeah. some of the local running groups, like our friends at the Cape Coral Running Group or the, um, the Fort Myers Speedsters. Oh, yes. Uh, some of the other, you know, uh, groups that run out of the, the, uh, 
uh, Fort Myers Track Club Mm -hmm. and uh, the Run Shop in Cape Coral. Yeah. Well, this race is really pretty straightforward. It begins and ends in at the base of the Cape Coral Bridge, basically. And the Cape Coral Bridge is a is about a um, well, it's it's about a mile long, approximately a mile long bridge that uh, spans the Caloosahatchee River and it connects Cape Coral to Fort Myers. And this is a morning out and back run over the bridge. It's and beautiful. It gives you a, a fantastic view of the Caloosahatchee River, uh, the Cape Coral skyline, which we have a very suburban skyline. <laughs> so it's mostly trees and houses with a very few uh, slightly taller buildings. Mm. But you get a nice view of the downtown Fort Myers skyline off across the river and in oh. the distance. And the race starts at you know 730 in the morning. It's, it's um, started with a, a helicopter flyover and uh, the national anthem. And then you're off to the run and Mm. it's it really has very little flat at the beginning before you start on the uphill (laughs) just a little (laughs) bit yeah it's it's a pretty short uh flat portion at the beginning then you go uh right to the uphill i actually have my my garmin uh with me right now and I'm, i'm looking i'm gonna look for the elevation because you you gain 129 feet in elevation in the first uh, about the first three quarters of a mile. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a it's a pretty good climb. Mm-hmm. I set out doing this one. I wanted to do a. You know, well, let me back up. During the Couch to 5K program that I live streamed with everybody, I was doing a very conservative five second run, 25 second walk uh, interval. Because the idea was to get that very beginner runner off the couch and moving and kind of get them ready for a pace that if they ever wanted to go to do a Disney race, you know, Disney tends to say the course time limit is uh, 16 minutes a mile. Now, they don't normally time the 5Ks, but the 5Ks tend to lead to runners wanting to do the 10Ks and the half marathons and maybe the marathons, and you have to maintain a 16-minute per mile pace. So we wanted to train for that minimum 16-minute a mile pace. And if you followed along with the program and then you follow along with the race that we did for that, we actually did a a race up in Tampa uh, for Father's Day. Mm Mm-hmm. And we not only met that goal, we exceeded that goal, uh, even doing a five second run or 25 second walk. Well, I wanted to do a little bit of a different interval, something a little bit more aggressive, but still something that was very approachable. And what I elected to do for this race was to do a um, 15 second run and a 45 second walk. 15, 45. 1545 Aha, uh-huh. was my so, interval. That is a three to one. It's a three to one ratio. Mm-hmm. So I, I was a little more aggressive. Uh, so I, I did a little more running to the amount of walking that I was doing. I still wasn't running a crazy amount and I modified it a little bit. I mm-hmm. actually elected what I decided to do was I would do the intervals like that 1545 on the flat. And then on the uphill, I would turn that into just a walk. And then on the downhill, I would do the intervals or run a little bit more and give myself a little more freedom to, to uh, run as much of the downhill as I was comfortable doing. Mm. But again, the whole idea is you, you want to save that gas in the tank for the end of the run. Mm -hmm. You don't want to smoke yourself going out and find yourself, you know, dying at the end. Puffing um, and puffing and yeah. Exactly. And doing that, I, you know, doing the out and back over the, over the bridge, I ended up with a total time of 41 minutes and 10 seconds, which averages out to a 13 minute, four second 
per mile pace. With a hill work. I mean, like a massive hill. With massive hills. And again, walking the uphill. Mm. I walked the uphill and I, and I did not run the downhill to the point where I was huffing and puffing. I basically did the, you know, just kind of a modified interval going down. Um, I might, I might've run, you know, 20 seconds on the downhill instead of 15. And then I, I do the walk interval. It was, it was, it wasn't crazy. I wasn't trying to do the entire downhill, nothing like that. Because again, I wanted to be able to maintain a, a rate of breathing that if I needed to have a conversation with somebody, I could. Mm, yes. And I, I wanted to, if I, if I wanted to at the end, really be able to turn it on once it flattened back out. Mm. So I was able to do that, um, uh, get a 13 minute, four second minute per mile pace, um, doing a 1545 with a lot of walking, uh, on both uphill stretches. So it was a great way to illustrate the versatility of the Galloway run, walk, run method. This was a, a faster pace than we got in Tampa doing the 525. And I, I didn't feel smoked at the end. I was, I, I was able to, you know, take photos with friends and talk to people. And, you know, th- this race was attended by, I want to say they said it was about 800 runners. Wow. Yeah, it was a much bigger event than they were initially anticipating. There was actually day of registration at this event. The event grew and and it exploded because people were hungry for, you know, races that they could go and attend in person. True. And the, of course, you know, your fast runners, your, your high school and college age kids that were out there, um, men and women were, were killing it. I mean, they were fast, 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 um, <laughs> you know, and you know, they're, they're on their return lap as I'm you know basically cresting the, the hill on my, on my first, you know, my, my trip out. So your first pass of the I bridge. Mean, they, Yes. Yeah. They were just insanely fast. So how was the weather? Well, uh, the weather, you know, was typical July in Florida. It is of course, you know, hot and muggy as, as you would expect the, um, I'm not ringing the bell cause I don't want to alarm or alert buck. <laughs> That's probably, he does not like best. it and he will end up in my lap if I do. So ding, ding, ding weather bell. <laughs> yeah, the um, the temperature uh, actually at the start of the race was 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it climbed to 88 degrees within 41 minutes. So Whoa. it's a seven degree increase in temperature in 41 minutes. So you're basically gaining a degree every six minutes. Um, uh. That should tell you it was getting warm fast. <sighs> and the humidity was absolutely no joke. I actually, I think I remarked on one of our live streams when I, we discussed this, this race a little bit in a live stream, yes. um, that when you start out on the race, you're actually on the mainland of Cape Coral and maybe you have a quarter mile before you get onto the bridge, if that. And the second you step off of the mainland onto the bridge, it's like there's a wall of steam projecting cool. up from the ground yeah. and it's palpable. You could actually feel it. And it was like this, this invisible barrier where literally from, from this step you were feeling okay. The next step, it was just sticky mm. and it stays with you. So it is a very, very humid race there's no no way around that it's July. but in florida the, <laughs> the the price that you're paying and in, in terms of the stickiness for the race the, it is well worth the view oh, the, the view on that race is gorgeous it is it's absolutely one of the beautiful races we've run yeah i can remember the year you had your surgery i ran that one by myself and you came yes. out and you were my cheer squad and support squad and I, I can mm-hmm. just, I, I remember taking a picture at the top of the bridge and, and sending to you because they are just gorgeous, the views. Now, you get a hill and you, if they didn't change the course, you get half of the overpass into Fort Myers. So you kind of yes, get. You actually, you actually get two hills. So it's still the same. 
it's still the same. The turnaround is on the top of the uh, of the. Once you crest the hill, it flattens out, and then it leads to another uh, to a, a small flyover uh, on of a roadway. Yes. And the turnaround is at the crest of that of that flyover. So you basically go up the second hill, you turn around, and you come back down. It flattens out, then you're back on the bridge. Mm. So. Mm. The nice thing about this one, you you can you can come to Cape Coral in the morning for this race. You can park, you know, in and around the downtown area. Yeah, which you know, plenty of on street parking, plenty of available parking for for the race participants. Yeah, you can run the race, be done, you know, within 45 minutes to an hour, you know, if you're a slower runner, and then you know it sets you up for. Um, enjoying what Cape Coral has to offer in terms of uh, food and beverage of oh. course, for, for brunch. And then if you're going to be in the Southwest Florida in the area, we have so many things to offer in terms of celebrations for so true. Independence Day. You know, Cape Coral has its own red, white and boom celebration, mm. which is basically a gigantic block party. And yeah. it's usually attended by about 40,000 people. Fort Myers Beach started their their fireworks celebration back up downtown Fort Myers had its celebration. So regardless of where you choose to go, this is a great way to kick off that day of celebration of our independence day. How was the post race? I mean, I know you said you talked with a lot of people, a lot of friends of the show and friends that you work with and take, and you got the chance to take pictures, but uh, how was, because the, the post race is usually, you know, there's a quite a spread because we have several local businesses that support that race. Yes. Um, this is put on by the Cape Coral Chamber of Commerce and the businesses that are participants in the chamber did an amazing job of putting it together. They had a nice uh, post-race food spread. Of course, you have all of your, your regular water and then, you know, your bananas and, you know, they had, they had food there available. And yeah. then they also had beer available as well. At what? <laughs> at 9 a.m.? At 9 a.m. <laughs> if you wanted to get, get a post-race recovery beer. And they had a nice little area set up uh, to this either side of the Cape Coral Bridge is uh, a, a small green space park called the Bernie Braden Memorial Park. And on one side, they had logistical prep for the, the, the celebration because after this race finishes, they shut the bridge down completely for the rest of the day. And they put up a giant music stage mm-hmm. and then back there uh, on the water, there are, I believe that's where they launched some of the fireworks from. So they actually have a no go zone for boats under the bridge. This is basically your last opportunity to enjoy this area before it's shut down for the for the big party. And mm-hmm. you know, on the uh, on the north side is where all the logistics are, and on the south side is where they had the the post race party uh, for the for the runners and their friends. And it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was it was nice talking to people. I didn't, of course, get to partake in anything uh, like that because you know we were in the midst or no beer of seventy no beer for you at that point. So proud, but so also, did hand, but didn't you, ha- didn't they have bananas or some, yeah, they, something? They, like I said, they had, they had bananas and some water. I, I'm going to say um, pieces Juice. of, of bagel and yeah, they have all the stuff that you would want for post-race recovery. And, uh, you know, I got a chance to, to meet up with, uh, Jessica from the coffee crew. Yeah. Uh, she was there running. So, you know, we got to take a photo right there at the start line. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it was a really, really nice race. This is one, again, I, I, I cannot recommend the, our area of Florida enough. Not only do we have a lot to offer in terms of natural beauty and places to go and things to do, we're also no more than about two or three hours or basically a quick day trip to all the major sites or most of the major sites in Florida. If you want to head over to the East coast we're two hours across the alligator alley, if you want to scoot up to the Orlando area, we're about three hours from Orlando. We're an hour and a half to two hours to, from Tampa. We're 45 minutes from Sarasota. So it's a great part of the state to come. If you want to kind of home base in Southwest Florida and then spread out and, you know, do some day tripping. Yeah. 
so, in this so race, nice. the Freedom 5K. I'm very proud of, of the work that uh, the, the Cape Coral Chamber, the president, Donna Germain, mm-hmm. um, and, and her team did to get this race ready. Because basically, you know, they didn't have as long to prepare this one. They, no. Since they did last year's race in October, July race ended up being pushed to October. Yep. They had to turn right around and start prepping for this race with fewer months to get it done. And they yeah. did an amazing job. They did. They did. They, they did an amazing job with the October one that was postponed. That was a little smaller and in a different location. But it, they did. It, it was. But every year. They do an incredible job. They did, and this is a, a um, the shirt that they, that you get for this is fantastic. Um, you did get a a participant shirt. You get uh, a bib. There are no medals. I believe that they did some awards for age groups. Yeah, I got one awards. in uh, October. Yeah, but uh, there's no <laughs> finisher medal. But no. you're also not getting killed on the race entry fee for this. I want to say it was about thirty or thirty five dollars yeah, for was race really, entry. So it yeah, was wasn't very bad. reasonable. Wasn't and bad. you got a nice little goodie bag and a tote. So you know, again, for what you paid, this was a, a great event. And I know that there was an associated charity to go along with this as well and you know they they also yes you know i know that they benefit i want to say it's the gunterberg charitable foundation yes and i don't know if, if the they brotherhood of heroes also brotherhood of heroes museum so that is you know that, that that's a veterans museum here in cape coral oh and also special operations communicators association fantastic yeah so one thing people may not know about our city is that we are uh, a Purple Heart city. We have a, a rich history and a large population of veterans here mm-hmm. in Cape Coral. Um, those that have recently separated from the armed services, as well as those that may have served in, you know, 20, 30, 40 plus years ago. So we have uh, a, a rich uh, military uh, veteran history here. Yeah. Well, even though I didn't do that race, all your talk of it has made me hungry. Well, I do what I can. So, shall we talk about food and beverage from, like you said, from three hours away? Why, yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> because, well, we, like you said, we did have an embarrassment of riches when we were up in the area of Disney a couple of weeks ago, or actually this was, this was more than just a couple of weeks ago, but we were on a quest. We were on a mission to find some plant-based options. Yes. And Amy through her sleuthing, sleuthing, and reaching <laughs> sleuthing, um, and you know, some help from Greg in Orlando. Oh Yeah was able to find us some amazing options. I was just glad he tipped me off to it so I could just keep looking and looking and looking for a reservation and finally snagged one on a Saturday evening a couple of hours before the park closed. So... Do you have any secret or tips for people trying to get dinner reservations at the sit-down restaurants in the Disney parks? I say you check all the time and often, but a lot of the time people are in the evening, they're off from work, they're relaxing, and then they're thinking about when they're going to go on vacation and talking with friends and family members who are going to be a part of their trip. And they're going, oh, maybe we'll rejigger this or maybe we'll cancel this and book this instead. So I would say in the evening, check the My Disney Experience app or the website to see if anybody canceled something that you can pick up. Good call. Yeah. That is good advice. So Skipper Canteen. Yeah, so this is a place I had I didn't know much about. No, because I'm a bad Disney um, Disney fan. I'm not good at it. Why do you say that? Because we just don't go to the Magic Kingdom a lot. I was going to say we don't attend the Magic Kingdom very often, and even when I did, I you know I 
we have historically not really been too big on the sit down restaurants in the parks. Well, usually we'll save our meal for going to Disney Springs and sitting down there. You mm-hmm. are a huge fan of Raglan Road, which is so hard to pass up every time we're there. We've been there once or twice. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> right. So, so this time, I, I think this whole seventy-five hard challenge has allowed us to get out of the comfortable favorites that we go to a lot of the time when we were outside this program, this 75 hard. And yeah, it's encouraged us to do some exploration. Yeah. So Skipper Canteen is themed after the Jungle Cruise ride. And this in Adventureland. This. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. There's something about this kind of theme that when you think of Disney's Jungle Cruise, you think of, uh, you know, adventures and khakis. And, you know, I, I get this this vision of of, you know, Teddy Roosevelt in, you know, a, a pith helmet and, oh you know, with his rifle slung over his shoulder and, you know, on a boat. And uh, that's just, it's just very pulpy and very, uh, nostalgic is not the right word. Cause I didn't live through that era, <laughs> but it kind of reminds you of those high adventure pulp f- novels and radio serials and TV shows, Yeah, you know, you know and, and the closest thing for people our age to really kind of relate to would be like Indiana Jones. Yes. And the Raiders of Lost Ark. True. True enough. So I, I just and I love how the cast members are so in character. Because yes, we were getting a yeah. little bit of a comedy routine. Uh-huh. Yes, our hostess was talking about some of the statues and memorabilia. I put that in quotation marks as we are heading to our table and making jokes about that. And I I don't even exactly remember the jokes. I just remember her manner and her personality being funny. And just, she offered to show us some of the highlights of the restaurant. And then she pointed at the chandeliers. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh You were, yes, I remember. I remember now. So the, (laughs) there it is. That's it. It was so funny. <laughs> she was funny. She was in character. I just remember them being so in character and making that a part of the experience. And it was great. And then we had amazing appetizers and entrees. Yeah, we did. I was shocked that we were able to get the quantity and quality of food from here that was all plant-based. And when we started looking at the items, I mean, these are things that I would normally order anyway, whether I'm doing the 75 hard or I'm going plant-based or not. So Mm. let's start with the the appetizer because this was right up my alley. Falls family falafel. I am my English teacher heart is singing for this you love the alliteration. alliteration. Yes. A secret recipe of chickpeas, garlic, onions, lemon juice, and herbs with a house made edamame hummus and toasted pumpkin seeds. Hmm. Yeah. Now there's a lot going on here. First of all, yeah. I love falafel. There, to me, there is nothing better than uh, you get a, a nice crispy falafel that's fried and put on a pita with, uh, you know, shredded lettuce and tomato and maybe some some uh, a, a looser hummus maybe as a sauce on that mm-hmm. or some tahini. Oh, that would be fantastic. But... That's not how they prepared this. This was this was like a little work of art coming to the table. Yes, it was. I loved that it, the blue, there was a blue plate 
And then it was the hummus, that lighter brown color of the hummus with oil and the pumpkin seeds thrown everywhere. And there's also, it doesn't say this in the description, there are radish slivers all around. And it says there are herbs. It looks, it, 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 they're strewn on the plate and the plate is dusted with what looks to be a red spice. And your paprika. That was, yeah, that was the paprika. And the, uh, when I've had falafel in the past, they have been bigger rounds. Like uh, when we had a falafel burger at Danger Danger before a couple, couple of years ago. Yes. That burger, it was like a flat patty falafel type thing. <laughs> Yeah, typically they're they're about the size of a of kind of a flattened out hush puppy. Yeah, this was more like a rounded hush puppy. Mm-hmm. So size, so and there were one, two, three, four. F- there were five of them, and the just the layers of texture alone, the crunchy outer coating, uh, uh and the hummus and the crunchy pumpkin seeds, the spice and bite of the radish and the oil. It just, it all came together to create a perfect little smoky, little bit of a bite. Uh, It was delicious. Oh yeah. I I'm with you a hundred percent. The, the, a falafel, when done right, has this beautiful, crispy outer, almost like outer shell mm. or outer layer yeah. that's crunchy. And then the interior is creamy. And mm. it's almost got a meaty consistency and an umami kind of flavor. And it's usually, you know, yeah. the spices, normally the herbs in there is going to have parsley. It's going to have garlic. It's going to have onions um yeah, and they and they, you know they even say garlic onions lemon that is very very traditional but then you get the smokiness from cumin and paprika and i was shocked at how much i liked the edamame hummus yeah but what a didn't... neat variety uh, or twist on hummus yes yeah but you could still tell it was hummus it was just just, just a different just bean. A different bean, slightly different, but still that same flavor, that texture mm-hmm. that you've come to expect. So you got the creaminess from that hummus. You got the crunch from the outer crust of the of the falafel. You've got mm. the little nuttiness from the pumpkin seed, mm. and you've got the the crisp. Like you said, kind of that bite from radish. Yeah, it's like nature spice. Mm-hmm. You know, vegetable spice. It was great. I would have it again. It was um, a big appetizer for ten dollars. I th- it was a big I appetizer think. for I mean, two people too. You know, I mean, let's be honest. Disney has elevated prices, but there's also elevated experience, and this was an elevated appetizer to me. It was, but you know what? I've ordered falafel from food trucks and from you know little mom and pops, and nine ten dollars for an appetizer this size. Yeah, that was actually good value for the money. Yeah, but then we had fantastic entrees. We did, and we went two totally different directions. Yeah, so let's start with yours. Okay. Um, I went. Uh, I am a huge fan of of curry. I like uh, Thai curries. I mm. like Indian curry. Mm. You name it. Um, and this is leaning more towards a Thai curry. And this was a curried vegetable crew stew. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is nineteen dollars, and the description says a favorite of the crew stew crew especially stew (laughs) seasoned or excuse me seasonal vegetables and pineapple tofu in a house-made curry sauce served with coconut rice 
And this is a plant-based option. Of course. So the description had me thinking that this was going to be this, this. Stew. Th- yeah, like a thick soup, you know, with vegetables in it. And I was expecting, you know, maybe, uh, well, what I was expecting wasn't what I got, but what I was expecting was <laughs> soft, soft vegetables and a thick, creamy broth with maybe some some pineapple soaked tofu, you know, stirred in. Mm-hmm. Not what not what I got at all. This was very clearly um, well thought out, and and they they made a point to really accentuate uh, each item. So you had the fresh cooked vegetables that still had a lot of crunch and bite to them. So, you know, you had your, your mixture of, you know, broccoli and, and green beans and peppers and Mm. carrots, everything Uh that would be in the quote unquote stew that's cooked properly. And then they have this wonderful, rich, light red reddish orange curry sauce Mm. poured over that Mm -hmm. and then in that mix is these chunks of tofu that have been i my best guess is that they've been marinated in pineapple juice and then flash fried because the tofu chunks were crunchy and you got just a hint of pineapple, nothing too sweet. They didn't go overboard, mm. but it gave you a nice textural element in addition to that hint of pineapple, which went very nicely with the coconut rice. Ooh, so yes. this is this was uh, like a, a, a medium grain rice that was a high starch content rice, so it was still sticky. Ooh. And it was probably cooked with coconut milk or coconut cream. So you had this flavor of natural coconut, you had this hint of pineapple, and then you had this creaminess of the curry sauce over these vegetables. So you could put together the perfect bite Mm. And get a little bit of vegetables, a little bit of the rice, a piece of the tofu, and oh, you're off to the races. It was phenomenal for nineteen dollars. I love Disney, that. Great price, huge portion. The, the, I, I, I again, if I wasn't even eating plant based, this is something that would catch my eye, and I would, I would gravitate towards it and i actually liked their semi deconstructed presentation of it better than what i was envisioning because what i was oh. envisioning was much more of a of a of a thick stew with a with a mound of rice in the middle oh which yeah. i had actually seen in yeah. some places i've seen it served that way and um, that's fine but what ends up happening with those types of preparations typically is the vegetables get a little overcooked oh. and in this case here you still had all the the all of the the bite and the freshness of the vegetables was preserved. So mm. this was a winner, hands down. I would get it again, even when we're not on on plan on a plan. I like that it came with that bread. Oh yeah, right. That uh, I mean, what well, doesn't look like bread? But uh, it looks like a pita pocket that has veggies cooked in it but uh i was all i wanted was to have the tofu that you had in my dish that i had (laughs) not that mine wasn't because mine was amazing mine was so good just you know spoiler alert tell us about your dish uh (laughs) that but the but the crusted and flash fried tofu that you had, woo! Oh yes, oh yes. So I had the Perkins Thai noodles, and this was twenty five dollars. This was tofu, not flash fried or you know that, but it was tofu. Seasonal vegetables, rice noodles tossed in a spicy soy chili garlic sauce, 
a favorite of our friend Pamelia Perkins, Adventures Club president. And of course, it is plant-based and indicated that on the menu. And you could get it with chicken upon request instead of tofu. So Mm -hmm. I just loved it. The rice noodles were cooked perfectly. The vegetables, they had just like there were, um, it was like matchsticks. They were matchsticks, so they went really well with the noodles. And it was carrot, it was squash, it was zucchini, it it was red onion. Ah, And then uh, we had microgreens on the top. And on the bottom was where that amazing sauce, that soy, that chili. Mm, it was not super spicy, but it had that that saltiness from the soy and just the, the chili gave the spice, the noodles, and then the, the tofu plus the crunchy vegetables had layer upon layer of different textures. It, I could just... And I could just drink that sauce. I mean, soy, chili, garlic, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. It was amazing. Now, the, this to me reminded me of a, it, it, it is not a pad thai. No. So if you're, if you're looking for pad thai, this is not the dish. This is a nod to pad thai. It's it a nod some, to pad thai, yes. It has some. 